Hello there, young fella. Hi, Dan. How are you? Nice to see you. Nice to see you as well. I love Leadership Freaks, so <laughs> thank oh. you for having me. Oh, wow. That is, uh, that's making my day, man. Oh, well, you're making mine, so. Yeah. Well, uh, it looks like, uh, are you home somewhere? I am. I just got back from three days for my book launch in New York. Got back last night, and I'm back in my office in Minneapolis. So this is my home office, so to speak. Not my home. This is, uh, I have an office about uh, three, about a 10-minute walk from where I live. Yes. Well, Good. Well, I'm excited. I was I've been so looking forward to this conversation back in 2015. They sent me uh yeah. this version of uh, True North, which was I think an expanded and updated edition and we had a conversation back then. Uh I just have to say I th for your work has helped me think much more about story and helping people tell their story and learning how, helping people, leaders learn how to listen to story and use the language and all. And so thank you so much for that. Well, it's interesting, Dan, you know, this is the academics don't necessarily approve of this approach, but what I found is when you develop a trust relationship with somebody you're interviewing, uh, they want to tell you their story. And under Harvard rules, every word that gets printed has to be approved by them, but it I'm always shocked at some of the things that they're willing to let me print, you know, that are pretty strong, you know. Uh, and so I, I love the fact that, and I actually think for the reader, it comes to more powerfully to hear it directly rather than secondhand. You know, like, here's what I think about, uh, you know, Corey Berry at Best Buy, or here's what I think about <laughs> Brian Cornell at Target. It's much more powerful to hear what they actually have to say, I think. Yes. And so, uh, and, but again, the academics don't necessarily approve of that approach, but that's okay. I don't it, care. It's okay. You're right. I'm not a real academic. I'm not trying for tenure. Right. Well, and this, uh, this version of uh, True North, the uh, one for emerging leaders, is uh, filled with great stories. Some, some of the same characters from the original. A few. Uh, yeah. Uh, yep. But and uh, <laughs> Hubert uh, Jolie is in here. I have to tell you a funny story. So I had a conversation with Hubert uh, over his book when it when it was launched, and uh, I took Spanish in high school. So when I got on, I said Herbert, and uh, I said, "How do you pronounce your last name? Jolly?" And uh, <laughs> I, I yeah, I call him Hubie Jolly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it's like, oh boy. That was, uh, but it's to me, it's a funny story. But I suppose it's a little embarrassing oh, too. So he's no, a no. great guy. I've worked with him uh, through two CEO gigs, uh, and uh, when he came to Minneapolis, and then uh, have helped recruit him, or primarily recruit him to Harvard Business School to come teach and take over eventually take over my courses, which he's doing now. And uh, that's why I really believe in what he wrote, and that's why I wrote the foreword to his book because I think he's fantastic. Yes, yeah, he's doing yes. great. There. And his, uh, you know, his generative leadership kind mm -hmm. of ideal in the book here is about being at, you know, working with students, uh, teaching, mentoring, being at Harvard there where he's at. So yeah. uh, that's a very exciting. So uh, I wanted to ask you before we dig into um, a True North for uh, emerging leaders. Um, Back in 2015, they sent me this book. Now it's 2022, so you know we got seven years. And I'm just curious about how you're different. Um, and you can interpret that question any way you want to, I guess. I don't mean weird, but just uh, how you're different. What's different about you and your life these days? Well, personally, I'm trying to stay really engaged with the emerging leaders. This is kind of the people that I teach all the way from MBAs up to new CEOs. I mean, we have a new CEO program. We got one coming up in a month. And we do. We've had about 400 CEOs of large companies go through that program, plus my courses on leading global business, authentic leadership. And so this is kind of my sweet spot of where I'm working right now, of trying to help. My goal, Dan, honestly, is help all these people reach their full potential. I'm not leading anything now. Uh, but so I get the satisfaction, if you will, vicariously, to see them do really well. So I have a commitment to, to work with them on an ongoing basis. Uh, no money changes hands from that ever, but uh, I think it's important 
hey, you know, that we have a new generation of leaders. I've been kind of bummed out with a lot of the uh, baby boomers and the kind of what I call the me generation, uh, you know. And so I, I really focus on that. I'm also given, uh, I'm trying very hard to stay in good shape. So I just got back from two and a half weeks in Switzerland, preceded by a week of llama trekking in Colorado up at 12,000 feet. So uh, trying to stay in, in good health. I, I think that's key to all of us at this age in life or at any age, to tell you the truth. Well, I, I think it's so of my age where bodies are falling apart. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's when you start to understand when people used to say to you, don't get old. And, uh, <laughs> then you start to understand that. I think I saw a picture of you and perhaps a grandson on top of in Colorado, if I remember yeah, on Facebook. Yeah. You were our grandson Freeman. We climbed, he and my son, the three of us, because uh, I wanted the three generation of Georges to climb a 14,000 foot peak. So we climbed my Democrat together. And got all up, to, all got to the top at the same time. So we had a little celebration. So yeah. uh, uh, I've climbed a lot in the past. I haven't climbed as many recently, but I want to make sure I could still do it. Yes, there I you go. See if he could do it. I want to see him do it too. So <laughs> see if he can keep up with Grandpa. <laughs> uh, or yeah, I didn't keep up with him going down. I tell you, I'm a little more timid going down. I don't want to fall. Yeah. We were just in Colorado, and man, coming down from. The top of Zermatt and Gornergrat. I, I didn't want to fall. <laughs> you know, there you go. it's easier when you fall going forward. You're going up. You put your hands on the rocks. When you fall going down, uh, that's a long way. <laughs> There's a huge difference between leading Medtronics and what you're doing today. And uh, I'm just curious about what you loved and maybe miss about you know, being in that CEO role and, and on the other hand, what you just relish these days? Great question. You know, Medtronic, I was all in and trying to build a Medtronic organization from quite a small organization, mid-sized company into a large one and also prepare it for the future and have the leaders. Um, I was never a medical expert. I mean, I had a vice chairman, Glenn Nelson, who was my partner, if you will, that I could turn to on all all things medical. I did engage very deeply and saw over 700 procedures with the doctors. But uh, I think I learned a lot about what we need in leadership. And so when I left, I put a 10 year limit on being CEO and I was only 59 years old. So I think the thing I've learned the last <clears throat> 20 years teaching at Harvard and before that in Switzerland is to really open up the aperture and realize there are a lot of great leaders in different companies, but there are also a lot of companies that are under led and they have the wrong leaders. And so I've had this passion now to try to transform leadership to people from command and control, old style, 1980s and 90s that I grew up in, leadership to uh, what I call authentic leadership, but really empowering leaders who help their people, who want to see people do well and who build great teams. And so that's been kind of my goal for 20 years. And so it's very different. I did serve on some large corporate boards until recently, that kept me kind of very much in tune. And I think working with these leaders keeps me in touch with the challenges they're facing. Yes. Uh, you were talking about um, authentic leadership and you use the coach kind of yeah. ac acronym uh, to express that, which we, we may get to in a, in a bit, but you use those letters to think about mm -hmm. that. Yeah. Um, what do you miss about leading Medtronics? Oh, I love the... Uh, passion of the moment and the challenges you have competitively with competitive and expanding the business through acquisition into diabetes and spine surgery and various neurological things. Uh, and of course, the companies continue to do that. So I miss that uh, kind of, you know, go, go rhythm of the moment. Uh, and uh, so that that's what I miss. And I love the people, love the mission. But, you know, you got to know when to hold them and when to fold them. And I feel that like when you complete your time as CEO, I moved downtown on day one. I was still chairman of the board for a year, but I really felt like you got to turn over your successor and let them do it and let them do it well and give them the support they need if they ask, but yes. not to try to intervene. What is your advice for people? Uh, I'm, it's interesting to me that you uh, said, you know, I'm going to be, uh, 10 years will be it for me and I'm going to step out, which is an interesting, uh, it's difficult for people to let go of the reins yes. and, and then to make a transition to a different kind of life. What is your advice to leaders who are, are struggling to let go of the reins? Uh, 
I think you're far better off to, to, to set a date to do the best you can and uh, go strong to the end and then turn it over. Make sure you groom a successor who can take the business, not doing what you did, but take it to the next level. That's my advice. And But I think uh, you, the founders are the ones that have the most problems. Founders really have trouble giving up. They can look Howard Schultz coming back for his third go at Starbucks. Uh, they consider it their baby. Uh, I consider CEOs and a, a hired CEO like myself in a different class that we have to do our very best. But our job is to see the enterprise thrive. And the best criteria you have for a CEO is the 10 years after you leave, how to do. And if the organization falls apart, I mean, look at General Electric, uh, the, the struggles they're having. So that doesn't speak well. Right. And But I do think you can stay too long, Dan. Here's the problem is that you kind of stifle the creativity. A lot of that comes with people in their 30s and 40s. And if everyone on top is in their 60s or late 50s, you aren't giving opportunities to young leaders. And today, we're in a digital world. We're in a whole different world of adversity and inclusion. Uh, and I think we need younger leaders. So the reason I wrote this book is to talk about this massive transformation in leadership from the baby boomers who have ruled the roost for 30 years to the new generations and to encourage them to step up and take charge and to do it differently. And uh, I think we're seeing that. What is your, uh, what are your thoughts about, well, first of all, I just, I recently read retirement can kill you. Um, <laughs> you know, the, the... <laughs> I agree with that, by the way. I, I, yeah, I always told people when they told me, Oh, you're retired. I'm, I'm not retired. I retired from Metronic. I didn't retire from life. Yeah. Yeah. So the generative phase um, that you talk about kind of fits into this stage. So, so you step away from your baby, you, you know, the CEO role, the official positions of leadership, and you enter a generative stage, which protects you, I hope, from retirement killing you, which I, I was amazed at the statistics. People who retire early die early. Yes. You know, you know it's better. it would be better to work until you're 65 like a traditional thing. Well, what they do, Dan, here, you know, because it's cold in Minnesota, a lot of the CEOs uh, pack up on a day after they leave the company and move to Naples, Florida, and they never hear from them again. And they're playing golf six days a week. And, uh, you know, but they are really engaged. And I think you have to really engage in the world. And the best way to engage the world is work with younger people. <laughs> Might be my grandson who's 14, you know, or my granddaughter who's 10. But uh, but it, I think it's with engaging with leaders in the real world today and what they're challenging. I can say this to you. Being CEO today is far more difficult than when I was CEO because in the old days, you could kind of put your head down, run your business well. Sometimes you had a debate with the FDA. Sometimes you had to work with Congress. But basically, it was managing the company from inside. Now, today, you've got all these forces coming at you. So we unleashed a torrent when we shifted from shareholder primacy Excuse me, yeah, to, to the stakeholder, multi-stakeholder. Now, I believe strongly in that, but it takes a very skilled leader to, to manage an LGBTQ community here and another group of people that wanted to do this or an ESG financial people saying, where's your plan and what are you doing? And, uh, you know, and what's your view on the Georgia voting rights or what's your view on George Floyd's murder? What's your view about... And you got to pick your places. You know, what's your view about overturning Roe versus Wade? And you know that you, once you make a comment on that, you're going to upset half the people. But as Bob Chapek learned uh, in his time at uh, Disney, he was a little naive. He, he couldn't ignore it either. He couldn't ignore his people. So a thoughtful statement is really important. So uh, I'm coaching a lot of leaders on that subject because it's so much harder today. Mm -hmm. Wow. Um <clears throat> So I was so glad to see your story again. And um, I, one of the leaders that I work with, uh, I, I knew she was interested in the true north sort of mm -hmm. uh, conversation. And I said, uh, hey, I'm going to have a conversation with, with Bill George. And what's a question you would like to ask? And she said, I would, I would like to hear him talk about his crucible. And, you know, the, those, that moment that, uh, you know, really formed or transformed you? Well, that, uh, you know, I, I, that started early. I had a, a father who uh, 
my father I thought was a good consultant. He he thought he was a failure because he never led things. He was very smart. Uh, he said, son, I'd like you to make up for my failures by uh, leading a large corporation. He even named the companies. Uh, one was Coca-Cola, which he said, I've held stock in since 1937. The other one was Procter & Gamble, and as he called it, an emerging computer company called IBM. Uh, but these are all great companies. But it kind of set, you know, as a boy, I was like 10 year, 9, 10 years old, the idea that somebody would be a great leader. So I can tell you in junior high and high school, I have never chosen to lead anything. I joined lots of organizations, never chose to lead, never liked student council, good enough tennis player to play college tennis, but not even co-captain of my high school tennis team. And uh, so I finally threw my hat in the ring to run for president of senior class. And when the votes came back, I lost by a margin of two to one to one other person. So I go off to Georgia Tech thinking I get a fresh start, did the same thing all over again, lost six times in a row. So the best thing that ever happened to me is when some seniors at Georgia Tech took me aside and said, Bill, no one's ever going to want to work with you, much less be led by you, because you're moving so fast to get ahead, you don't take time for other people. Mm. And they were 100% correct. Leadership is not about a resume. Leadership is about relationships. If you want to lead people, you have to build a two-way relationship of trust. And so uh, I learned a lot from that and was fortunate to change a lot of things, get to know people better, spend my time differently, and lead a lot of organizations. That was the best thing to have me leadership-wide. Then I had this back-to-back -to -back deaths of my mother and my fiance three weeks to the day before our wedding, uh, which were really shocking to me because I've always been kind of a person who looked to the future. Well, all of a sudden, you know, neither my mother nor my fiance had a future, and I never got a chance to say goodbye to either one of them. So it really forced me to think about what's really important in life. What do I want to do? What do I want? How do I, I've got one short time on earth? No one knows how long we're going to be here. I could have a heart attack today and be gone. So what are we going to do to make a difference in the world with the gifts that we, uh, we were given? And so I focus that on that very carefully. But I can tell you, years later, I again, I'm on my way to the top at Honeywell, great global company. I'd run Honeywell Europe. I'd run every major business there. Uh, and... Uh, I was driving home one day, and I was one of the two, if not the leading candidate to be the next CEO. It was three, four years off. But I looked myself in the rear mirror, view of your mirror, and saw a miserable person, me, mm -hmm. because uh, the problem was is that I was kind of grabbing for that brass ring and dressing a certain way, wearing cufflinks, which I don't wear, trying to say just the right thing to the board, hold back on a lot of my passions, which is not who I am. And uh, so uh, talk my, I told my wife this. She said, Bill, I've been trying to tell you for a year. You didn't want to listen. So she was right. So uh, my men's group the next morning, I've been meeting with every Wednesday morning, then for about 15 years, now for about 45. And uh, they said, uh, why would you turn down Medtronic? And I said, well, it's kind of a mid-sized company, kind of the ego coming out. And I said, well, why don't you give it a shot? So I made that decision to go to Medtronic. It's the best decision of my life. Because here's a company where I could be myself, show my passion, uh, you know, and really get committed to a mission of restoring people to full life and health and be in a company where the values were talked about all the time. Honeywell had good values, you just couldn't talk about it. They, uh, at Medtronic, it was a different world. So I had a chance to build an organization, which was fledgling, I would say. We were uh, 750 million in sales when I went there and wound up at now at 30 billion, but build and shape and, and help mentor a lot of younger leaders that have come up and taken big roles in, uh, in in Medtronic. So that was kind of my story, but those crucibles you can see going all the way back to high school, then I was kind of repeating it in my late mid forties before I went to Medtronic and uh, kind of getting caught up with titles and external things. So I realized that's not what it's all about. It's really about the good you do for people. You didn't, you haven't mentioned that I noticed anyway. <clears throat> um. I was thankful to read about your fiance and your mom. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but you, uh, I don't see a connection between Medtronics and your mom dying of a heart attack. And I, I don't know if that even matters, but have you ever thought about that? Sure. I mean, my mother died. Technically, she died of a heart attack. She had ravaging cancer, lung cancer, and my oh, fiance man. died of a malignant brain tumor. My wife, Penny, had, uh, in the midst of my time with Medtronic, she had uh, 
uh, breast cancer. So yeah, it's uh, that's uh, that's one of the reasons I served on the board of Mayo and, and appreciated it so much on the board of Novartis where they're doing life saving drugs. So yes, absolutely. But I don't want to purport myself or present myself as a medical expert. But yeah, that life and death. That's why I saw these procedures. I saw one person die on the table over in Paris. And but, you know, I mean, life and death procedures. And I realize that's, you know, where life hangs in the balance and the skill of other people to pull you through that is so critical. And if Medtronic could help them be effective, that was the whole goal. Enable the doctors to restore their patients uh, to full life and health. And that was the whole goal. So, yeah, they're very definitely connected to Medtronic. They weren't at Honeywell or before that at Lytton, uh, right. but that kind of finally fell into place. It hadn't right dawned on me before. Yes. Um, when you use the word uh, crucible, the, the illustrations in the book, um, like for Hubert, it's sort of like one kind of yeah. valley moment. Mm -hmm. uh, but also you think about the plural crucibles, which mm -hmm. you, you kind of just went through. Mm -hmm. um, so do you look at this? Uh, how do you look at the idea of, well, you have this one crucible but you have many yeah well i think it, it's likely and i think often the reason i ask people to go back and in the classroom and and process what happened to them in the first 18, 18 years of their life because you may find yourself repeating that okay let's say, say you had a father who was a tyrant that never spent any time with him. my father was not a tyrant but suppose you did you might get hooked by a tyrant at, at uh, in, in your job i found myself doing that with, I went to work at both Lytton and Honeywell for great leaders. They, they stepped down or retired and they were replaced by people who frankly were, one was a tyrant, the other one was uh, very manipulative and I hate to be manipulative. I saw that happen to my father. So I said, that's not gonna happen to me, but it brought out the worst in me. You know, I just said, I'm gonna draw a line and I felt like I'm putting, when I was going to Honeywell, I felt I had to put on the armor every day to protect myself from my boss. And that's not a good feeling. Right. No one should go to work with that feeling ever. And so uh, that that's why I <laughs> that that's uh, very important. So then I found myself actually repeating. And so I think a lot of people do that. I found I'm really struck by how many people in their 40s have significant career crucibles like Hubert. They think they've reached the top of the mountain. As he says, the top of the mountain was hollow. And there was no joy there. Yeah, I did the whatever. I made the numbers. And that's why he had to go off with these monks and rethink his whole life. And I think a lot of people, I saw it having my own son when he left Novartis. And so a lot of people are doing that now in their 40s. And by the way, that's led to this so-called great resignation. Uh, I think it's just COVID's caused people to think about, is this what I want to do with my life? Are these the people I want to work with? Are these people that nurture and bring out the best in me? If you have a boss that's bringing out the worst in you, you're in the wrong place. So people say now is people don't leave companies, they leave bad managers. And one of the things I'd like to see is uh, top leaders, and I talk, teach us as CEOs, is don't tolerate toxic people in your organization. They may appear to perform, Dan, but they're, they're really just taking the credit for people that work for them. And uh, they can do more harm. In fact, before you promote somebody, you better look at are they developing leaders or are they running them out? Uh, and if they are, uh, then you, you shouldn't, you should, whatever you do, don't promote them. Yes. You, in the book, talk about the, the leader's journey and three stages oh. or phases, mm -hmm. right? Self-discovery, self-development, right? And then more of the lead yeah, people yeah. and move from I to we. Um, how do you, I guess to begin with, what do you mean by those three stages? But the second question is, how do we help people navigate that journey? Because perhaps we get stuck somewhere and we don't really appreciate how to yeah. navigate to the next place. So first of all, just talk a bit about those three stages that you see in leadership. Well, first of all, you got to recognize it is a journey. It's not, I was naive enough to think when I came out of uh, school at 22 or 23 or 24, it's like a rocket ship to the moon. You get there and you wind up at your highest position. Hopefully it's the goal in my case of being CEO. And uh, no, it's not like that. It's a lot of ups and downs, as you know, I've been discussing a lot. And I think helping young leaders realize there are gonna be these ups and downs in life. 
And in fact, the development, you learn more when you go through the down periods than you ever do for the ups. You, you know, when you're, when you're on an up stage, you think you're better than you are. When you're down, you probably think you're worse than you are. And you need people around you to help you through those. But I found that, you know, whereas when we got out of school, man, we just needed a job. Just give me a job. I got to pay off my college debts and I just need enough money to pay for my apartment. Today, it's not like that. People are kicking around for like uh, up to 30, you know, rubbing up against the world, as we call it, seeing where I fit. And it took me a while to find out where I fit. So that's not unusual. There's nothing wrong with that. But then about 30, you really start stepping into important leadership roles. And I would like to see people do that early. I had the benefit of starting the consumer microwave oven business for Litton Industries at 27. Boy, that was a great, you know, it was like a rocket ship. And it was, it was great. But I think that uh, this period from 30 to 60 is when you are leading. But often it's when you get knocked down, you find out like Hubert, maybe I wasn't leading the right way. Maybe it was all about me. And he made that I to we journey and wanted but Best Buy and Pete, a totally transformed leader, totally different than he was at Carlson, because he realized it's not about me. It's all about the people. <laughs> he calls it human magic. It's all about how do you inspire the people? That's kind of my definition of human magic is inspiring people to do great things. So, but he would just be illustrative of many, many leaders in that period. But then you reach your peak and say, I say it comes around 60, somewhere in there, but then don't retire. I remember I talked to John Cotter, who himself is a great leadership guru of the generation before me. And he said, Bill, you know, you're going to turn 60 next year. Uh, what are you going to do the rest of your life? You got about 30 years to go here. Aren't you a lot wiser today uh, than you were at age 30? And can't you apply that? So that's what I've been trying to do. And I think, you know, you called, Eric Erickson called this the period of generativity, giving back. It's also the wisdom period, because by broadening your base, you can advise people. I'm mentoring a lot of people, and some of them, I think I'm saying obvious things, and to them, it's original. How do you deal with a difficult board? How do you deal with a, a subordinate, a male subordinate that women refuse to work for? Uh, you know, and to me, that's pretty straightforward. But for them, they think, you know, wow, I really appreciate your advice. So I think you have this uh, an opportunity to look across a much wider playing field and see what you can learn and apply that and share that. And I think we should do that. That's why I'm against checking out at 60 and playing golf the rest of your life. Nothing wrong with golf, but I think you have an obligation to share what you've learned with other people. I'm uh, using the language of sage these days. I like the language of sage. Be a sage in people's lives and get comfortable with that. Don't be showy yeah. or anything, but kind of be that person. Yeah, no, that's right. And why not? You know, and, you know, I think, but a lot of it at this stage is role modeling too. Like I have a 14 year old grandson that we talked about, you know, I can't tell him what to do with his life. I just have to be a role model and be there when he wants to talk. You know, when he wants to ask complex questions. Mm -hmm. And so that's a very different role. That's kind of your role of being sage. It's yeah. not saying here, one, two, three, four, or five, here's what you should do because you don't know. Right. <laughs> but And everyone's got to figure it out for themselves. And by the way, it's not so easy to figure out who you are in your life. That's why I encourage you before you go out and try to lead, figure out who you are and what, what, what resonates with you. That's your true north that you started asking about. Mm -hmm. you know, figure that out first. Yes. So in the three stages, you have uh, self-discovery, self-development, and then lead people. What's your key insight about self-discovery? Knowing who you are comes from your life experiences and going back and digging deeper. Some people say, I've never had a crucible. Really? I don't think so. I think you may have been denial about that. Uh, being rejected in high school might be quite a crucible. Your parents divorced that you kind of say, well, I'll get through that. But it might have been very painful, you know, the disagreements to you as a little girl or a little boy. And so going back and processing that and doing it with a, a mentor or a small group of people, or in my case, my wife, uh, you know, I think that can be very helpful, too. As Dan Goldman said, you never know who you are until you hear yourself tell your story to someone else. And I think that's right. I, I think he's got it right. So that's sharing, that kind of intimate sharing. And we, in our society, for a long time, men didn't do that. Hmm. And I've created these small groups at Harvard. Every class I ever teach, as you go from the big class of 60, let's say, down to 
six people, yourself and five other people, no professionals in the room, no psychologists, no one there, no teachers. And you talk about these things in a very intimate setting and you find, hey, you know, I'm, I'm a little ashamed to tell you what I did back in high school, but all of a sudden you've had an experience too. I didn't realize that about you. You seem so well put together. I didn't realize you had some problems too. They weren't different than mine. So I think that that's how you have to, that's the self-discovery phase. And you have to take time. You know, as I've said, the hardest person you ever have to lead is yourself. That's because it takes time to figure out who you are. But how can you lead other people if you don't know who you are? Then you're probably management, practicing management 101 and directing people, and that doesn't work today. Yes. Um, Harry Kramer, uh, I, I talked to Harry. He's, a, he's you know, you, your language is true north. Harry Kramer keeps talking about values, but in particular, self-reflection. I mean, that's yeah. like his, that's his. I said to him, Harry, you're like a one-string banjo. Every time I talk to you, you want to talk about self-reflection. I suppose to you, I could say, you're like a one-string banjo. Every time I talk to you, you want to talk about true north. You want to, you know, but... Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so, uh, oh, but I'm with Harry on that. I mean, you know, values are part of your true north. I like Harry a lot. And I've, I've endorsed his books as well because I like what he's doing and his work at, you know, first at Baxter and now at, uh, you know, at uh, Northwestern at the Kellogg Schools. Yes. So, uh, is self discovery hear your story, listen to your story, think about crucible moments when it comes to self development? Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts about really doing that well? Well, I think the first thing you do is you have to develop your self-awareness. I must say there are lots of times I was clueless. And I think in addition to the things we've been talking about, Dan, two things I recommend to people. You need to have some form of, and I say to the CEOs, what is your pra introspective practice? What do you do for reflection? You can't go 24-7 hard every day working off your task list because you will not be a good leader. So you need to pull back and ask yourself, uh, uh, how did I show up as a leader today? What did I do? Chip Berg in the last chapter of the book talks about the five questions he asks himself. And take 20 minutes once a day, maybe twice a day, but at least once a day to think about, did I feel fulfilled in what I was doing? Did I show up as a leader? Was I helpful to people? And reflect on that. The second thing that I think is equally critical is getting honest feedback. And, uh, and you need to have people around you on your team at work, uh, your personal friends, spouses, mentors, they will tell it like it is. And when they see you going off, will tell you that you're not showing up as your best today, or I don't understand what's happening to you. Why are you chasing this? And will challenge you. And so having truth tellers around you is critical. You can't be a good leader today. Uh, John Dunn wrote, no man is an island. We're all part of the main. You know, you really have to have people around you that help you stay on track. And by the way, it's a two-way street. You help them stay on track, too. But it's, it, that's essential, I think, in all the leadership we have. So if you can do those two things, that's how you gain self-awareness. But the important thing is you can, in that process, have compassion for yourself. For me, as a little boy that got run over 110 pounds in ninth grade football, it came back to Okay, eventually I was a starting linebacker, but boy, I got to run over pretty bad. I got rejected by the girls. <laughs> it's going okay now, but it's, you know. And so you have to have some compassion for yourself. And then I think you can find that fulfillment of being who you are. And that's where I kind of stage I'm on now. I feel good about where I am, you know, but it took a long time to get here and do hard work. Uh, and lots of, lots of people around me that helped a lot. Mm. I uh, had three conversations in the course of 30 days that were very transformative for me about this. The first was with Jim Parker from uh, former CEO of Southwest Airlines. And I said, right. hey, what's your best advice? He said, well, I love to tell leaders to be yourself, which I thought was the most underwhelming thing I ever heard. <laughs> you know? And then a, a, a week or two later, I had a conversation with Frances Heschelbein and she said, you know, leadership is a matter of how to be, not how to do. And it's right. like, that freaks me out. I'm like, just tell me the five things to do. I'm ready to go. Right. And then, you know, that conversation with Harry Kramer, when, you know, he said, you know, you, you, this moment that he had as a young fella, his, his future father-in-law took him to the uh, three-day silent retreat. And he said, you know, I learned about self-reflection and it's sort of, it, it was then that those kind of ideas started slowly coming together for me you know that there is a, a whole process and uh it's 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 a fantastic thing moving from 
you know, the I to we mindset. And I watch leaders really arrive at this, you know, because what it is, I, 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 as you work your way up, and then all of a sudden you get to this point where you get what would be more leadership role and not a doer role. And wow, it's a challenge. How do we move from I to we? That's a great question, because I think in many ways, uh, the, the many of the uh, baby boomers still hanging around are still I leaders. <laughs> they haven't made that. It's all about them. And you see this and the media plays on charisma and people like that. And, and I think it's all the wrong stuff. Uh, I think you have to take that journey. Most of us do start out as, as in an I mode and I leaders in our first jobs. And we're trying to perform and look good. I think we've got to make that transition. Realize that the people who work with you are not there to serve you. You're there to serve them. So you got to flip it, flip the script, if you will and realize how can I help you reach your full potential? And if I, as a leader, can help everyone on my team reach their full potential, they've got to do it. But if I can help them, I can support them, then uh, then I can be, we're going to have a great team and we're going to win. And we're going to come together on a series of common goals and values. Uh, but that key to make that transition, some people never make it. And so I think uh, because they get caught up in external adulation, they get caught up in, you know, money, fame and power, the three great tempters. And those are the things that derail you, and pull you off course. And if you can stay grounded in who you are, that's what's really critical. Mm -hmm. And uh, that being a wee leader. And I think you find all the great leaders and a lot of the people I focus in my new book, The Emerging Leaders, are really we leaders. And they're getting there earlier than their predecessors did. Frankly, being an I leader is not going to work with the millennial generation or even the Gen Xers. Uh, they're just going to reject it. They're not going to follow an I leader. So uh, they better learn pretty quick. Well, you just mentioned derailers and in, um, in the book, you mm -hmm. talk about the derailers of success. What do you think the most dangerous derailers of leadership success are? I think getting caught up in uh, the external feedback. Uh, from people about how great you are and because of the prestige of your wealth, because of the charisma you show, because of the power you exert over how many people you have under you, whatever your revenues are, all these things that really don't matter. I thought they mattered early in my career. I learned in Medtronic. That's not what's important. And uh, and frankly, getting caught up in your own fame. I see this happening to Elon Musk. What a great brilliant inventor he is, but he can get caught up in his own fame. I see it happened with Jeff Bezos, who did a great job at Amazon. Now he's building a $500 million yacht that he can't get out of the, he can't get out of the harbor in, in Rotterdam because of the bridges, the bridge he has to cross. But no, I think a lot of people, Mark Zuckerberg very much has gotten caught up in that at a young age, and he never got himself grounded in his true north. And so it's really hurting. I, I think it's sad uh, when I see this happen. So uh, one of the people I talk about in the book was a close colleague of mine uh, on the Goldman Sachs board, Rajat Gupta, former head of McKinsey, a great leader. I looked up to him. I thought he was terrific. And uh, he engaged. Uh, he wanted to get wealthy. He was worth $120 million at age 60. Most of us can kind of struggle through to get through to the end. But he wanted to be a billionaire. Why, I don't know. Maybe it has more status. And uh, so he traded the most valuable information I've ever had on a board of directors you know, to a well-known inside trader. And he wound up in jail for two years. And it's very sad that that happened because here we lost a great leader. And I wish I had known that what he was going through because I would love to have counseled him say, Raja, watch out, don't get trapped. Now his story was that he was penniless uh, when his father and mother died and he was oh. a teenage boy and he'd take care of his sister. He never overcame his need for financial security. He had financial security, but then it became a more, more, more. And when your goal is more money, there's never enough because there's always somebody wealthier than you are. Yes. I think Warren Bennis may be the prime example of staying grounded and being yourself and not getting caught up in yachts and big cars and everything. Yeah. Well, Warren Bennis did more to help me post Medtronic than he and David Gurry and anyone else. I went to a seminar there as the Aspen Institute and he kind of adopted me Put took me in his wing and helped me get my first book, Authentic Leadership, published in 2003 as part of the Warren Bennis series of Josie Bass. But he helped me a great deal on True North. Uh, never wrote a word, never edited a word, but just the ideas. And he is a very extraordinarily wise person. 
And I think, honestly, he was looking for someone to carry on his work and take it to the next level. Because I first learned about the idea of crucibles in his book, Geeks and Geezers. And so I tried to take these leader, these ideas and develop them in the classroom with people, flesh them out, and then write about them. But he was an amazing human being, great loss to the world when he died. I think he was 89. You know, he was still teaching at 89. I went to the next to last class he ever taught. And uh, he was quite ill with cancer at the time, but he could hardly speak. But he was there, and the students just looked up to him as a, such a wise person, as did I. Yes. Um, let's end on uh, the sage, the generative leadership. I, I find, I think there's such an untapped resource in the world and in our organizations of leaders who are just sort of uh, uh, people, not just leaders, people who are filled with wisdom and don't really know how to do it or how to share it or what to do with it or how to maximize it. What do you like to say to people who might be in the sage stage, but are underutilized? Uh, share your wisdom, your ideas, engage with people in younger generations. Don't stop. Don't just hang around with people your age and all grow old together. I saw my father do that. He regretted it, but he did it. Uh, engage with people at all generations, you know, and that's why it's so important that you do that. Uh, one of my role models for leadership when I was coming up was John Whitehead who was chairman, he's the person that built Goldman Sachs. He went on to become deputy secretary of state under George Schultz. He was head of Boy Scouts in 2010, 12 organization. And he came to my classroom and he said to the MBAs there, he just pushed a, a, published a book called A Life in Leadership. He said, don't check out at 60. Don't move to Florida and never be heard from again. Stay engaged, stay engaged to the world. That's what he did. He did do his very last day in his mid to late eight in his late eighties, you know, but stay in, that's a Warren Bennett said, stay engaged with the world because to me, you're constantly learning. I never walk into a classroom at Harvard where I'm not trying to learn from my students, whether they're CEOs or whether they're MBAs or whether they're middle managers, I think I can learn from them and I can learn from the wisdom of my grandson, you know? And so, yeah, I think that two way street of learning when you stop learning, that that's when you lose. So, but that being a sage is a constant learning process. And the thing I love about not just focusing on one organization, but having a, the opportunity to look across a lot of people and a lot of organizations and write about it and engage with people. I engage with a lot of people on social media. I've never actually met in person. They're wonderful people. They have wonderful ideas. So I, I, I respond to everything that's written on social media, unless it's something unserious, but particularly on LinkedIn, because I'm learning from people. And I think that constant learning, Satya Nadella, who I feature in the book, who's a fabulous, probably the best leader in the world today, Satya says we have to go from know-it-alls to learn-it-alls. We're constantly learning. And if you're constantly growing, that keeps you young. You must be doing that in your own work because you're constantly learning from people you're talking to. And I think that's what keeps you young. I had no idea. <laughs> yeah. I had no idea about that when I first started writing Leadership Freak. It's still a hobby to me. I, I don't think of myself as it's a business. I sort of despise that, but uh, I, I work hard at it every day. But anyway, I started writing and then I got this book from Harvard Press in the mail. Um, you know, they, you know, we want to send you a book. It was Dave right. Rich. And, uh, and uh, I, I, I said, you know, I, I'd really like to talk to, these people and uh, people ask me about the books on my shelf and almost all of them have been sent to me and mm -hmm. uh, and what is so precious and so exciting is that if you go across any one of those shelves I'll be able to pick off a book and say you know I, I learned that I had a conversation with this person I had a conversation with this person there's every shelf is relation you know not a you know friendship relationship but it's a learning <laughs> sort of relationship right. I had no idea, but that has been the cherry on top for me uh, is all of these conversations that I've been able to have over the years. It's amazing. Fantastic. And you're constantly, you know, I love to see your, your bookshelves. I, I've got my own set out in the next room, but, yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, but no, I, I think that is important. That's the learning process yeah. and that's how you grow. Yeah. You know, when you stop learning, you stop growing, then you're just, you're on a long-term decline. You know, so you constantly have to find yourself in situations where you're learning from other people. 
And if you think you know it all, <laughs> that's kind of the end of it. Yes, absolutely. Well, I just have to say thank you for your contribution to uh, the leadership community. Thank you for taking time with me. Uh, you know, this this our second conversation, and uh, I I was totally anxious to uh, have you know a, more of a conversation with you about this. So thank you for that. Um, and uh, I wish you well as you. Thank you. Thanks for what you're doing and inspiring and forming people and helping them become better leaders. If we're kind of fellow travelers and walking along the same path, you know, intersecting sometimes. So yes. you should keep going too. So thank you. Thank you.